All right, uh, question number one. We didn't make it very far last week. Uh, just the last part of chapter 11. But question number one, who betrayed Jesus? Everyone. Yeah, yeah. As long as you didn't put down just Judas. That's the whole point I wanted to make there. What does the term betrayed actually mean? Hand over. To hand over. That's exactly right. And so that would be the, uh, uh, the Jews, the Ro Romans, Pilate, uh, God, Jesus, as well as Judas. So yeah, all of the all of the above there. Question number two: How do you know that the bread and the juice are not really Jesus' body and blood? There's several ways, but there's one way that we pointed out last week. How do you know that it's not? It's written in the neuter. Because yeah, the, the word "this" is in the neuter. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And how do you spell that? How <laughs> talk? <laughs> <laughs> is the Greek word which whatever <laughs> um, uh, when, when did the new covenant begin he says this is a new covenant in my blood which by the way without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness according to the book of Hebrews right uh, well it's not just the book of Hebrews but yeah when did, when did, the, new, when did the new covenant begin Christ. Uh, death of Christ Hebrews chapter 9 uh, what does the word remember mean? Obviously, I hope you get more than just remember, because there's extra significance to this word. What does it, what does it mean? I wouldn't hear last week on spitball. Okay. Well, dodge the spitball then. <laughs> well, it means more than just remember, though, yeah. to, put it into, uh, <coughs> to put it into place and as part of your life. Yeah, yeah. I was it, there last week. Yeah, yeah it's the idea... Uh, Remembering the, the way the terms used throughout the Bible, the idea of remembrance is not simply to reflect on something that happened in the past, but the purpose of bringing that to mind is that it might make a difference right now. So there should have there should be some sort of impact or some sort of difference because of that which is uh, reflected upon. Question number five: Must a person be worthy to participate in communion? Nobody's worthy. Thank you. It's impossible to be worthy. This is an adverb. Remember we pointed out it's adverb. It's talking about worthily or in a worthy manner. And uh, it, it's kind of ironic to me because a worthy manner is to realize you're not worthy. That, that's, that's part and parcel to doing it in a worthy manner. Mark, there is an exception to that. Excuse me? There is an exception. The Catholic Church. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what does it mean in question number six? It was denied communion. Oh, you know, it's not just Catholic Church. There are a lot of churches that practice what's called closed communion. And there was a, there was a period of time when, uh, and, and this has been quite a while ago, but there was a period of time where you had to undergo scrutiny of church leadership before you would be allowed to participate. Uh, they'd sit you down and ask you a series of questions, or they go through some process and determine whether or not. Why uh, oh, well, you give me this test every week? <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys, uh, a lot of you know. There's Tom. All right. Hey. Um, uh, Dr. Jack Cottrell. Uh, I heard him give a communion meditation once, where he where he stood up and he said, "I just want everybody to know I'm allowed to take communion today." And he pulled out this coin. It was a wooden coin. But on there, it was said something to the effect, passed for communion. And it was a, it was a relic that he'd picked up somewhere along the line that uh, a Presbyterian church used to use. And they would have, because, because frequently in churches like that, they didn't, take, didn't have communion every week. They do it on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis. But before anybody would be allowed to participate, they had to sit down and undergo the questioning and the evaluation and everything, and if you pass the test, you got the coin. Really? You, really? And then you brought that coin with you to, um, to uh, participate in community service. And what's really interesting to me, there have been all sorts of wild, can I say, uh, uh, extreme views about communion. And in fact, I, I remember this as a kid, a uh, church where my dad was preaching. There was a guy in the church there, and this is probably a bit prevalent, but there was one man very strong opinion that your sins weren't forgiven. Even though you were a Christian, 
you got your sins forgiven when you became a Christian, but then God started keeping track again until you took communion each week. And at communion service, you got this late white clean. You probably know the name of God. I don't remember, but you, I just remember at one of the churches, he made a real <laughs> point about this, and I was just a kid, and I'm like, really? <laughs> somebody, somebody believes that? And here, I'm just a kid, and I'm thinking to myself, well, what happens if you die on Saturday night? <laughs> You're in a lot of trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. Can I ask Glenn what you was that uh, before or after Lincoln was inaugurated? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, it, it, I want you to know, though, it's not just a, a different view on communion. That goes against what the Bible teaches. 1 John chapter 1, it's in the present tense, it says that uh, the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on forgiving us of our sins. That's it, it's extremely important to realize. So when you became a Christian, God didn't just wipe out your past. He's forgiven us our sins, and He keeps on forgiving us our sins as long as we remain in Christ. So there, there, there have been some really extreme views then. Okay, what does it mean, question number six, what does it mean to discern the body? <clears throat> Remember that phrase it uses in verse, uh, which verse is it? Verse 29. Anyone who eats or drinks without discerning the body eats or drinks judgment to himself. What does it mean to discern the body? And which, by the way, I will take two answers here. I have a strong view on this, but I realize there's different views. What body are we talking about here? Church. I have a strong view that 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 it's really talking about the church. Because he starts off in verse 17, and then when he gets down to the end, he makes this conclusion. Right after talking about this, he says, So then, brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. He's really emphasizing the fellowship. So I think he's talking about the body of Christ. In fact, chapter 12, what we're going to go to tonight, he's going to spend over half the chapter talking about the body of Christ, talking about us. Right? So he emphasizes that. What's the alternate view here? I just want to be fair. What's the other possibility when he says, without discerning the body? Your personal body? Well, the major alternate view wouldn't be your personal body. It would be so the body of Jesus who hung on the tree. Mm -hmm. So really understanding why Jesus did what he did and appreciating that. that That is, I've got to admit, that is a, possi uh, a possibility there. Question number seven, what kinds of judgment had God brought on, <coughs> on the church at Corinth at this point. He says, because of this, a number of you have, have what? Weak, sick, death, died. Yeah. Uh, weak, sick, fallen asleep. And he's talking about death. So even to the point of death, that's pretty strong judgment. How can you prevent God's judgment? What does he say should be done here so that we won't come under judgment? Judge yourselves. Judge yourselves. We judge ourselves so that we won't come under God's judgment. Which, by the way, I know this is talking about uh, let a person examine themselves, but I really think that there's so many passages that talk like Matthew chapter 7, where it talks about it's so hard to judge in a, an effective way, but at the end of the day, one of the best things we can do for one another is judge each other. Mm -hmm. you just have to be very careful how you do that, because he doesn't say, just remove the log out of your own eye. Remove the log out of your own eye so that you might be able to Remove the speck out of your breath. So there's a lot of, it's really hard. You've got to put yourself in their shoes. You've got to work on your own issues. You've got to do it in a loving way. But at the end of the day, we need to help each other out. And one of the reasons we need to be judging each other in this careful way is it prevents us from having to be judged by God. I, I, I think this passage is huge. Okay, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is question number 9. Uh, why does God judge us? I'm talking about in this context here. Why does God judge us? Discipline. Okay. I would take that for uh, Hebrews chapter 12. He talks about discipline. And there, there is an element of discipline here. But look at verse uh, 32. When we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that what? Yeah. So discipline is part of it. That's exactly right. But so that we won't be condemned along with the world. It's for our own good, for us to be saved. Okay, what, is, what advice at the end of the chapter is given to those who are hungry? So, as, as, as contrast to between the Christians and the rest of the world, the Christians may misbehave, but they were being judged so that we can be disciplined. 
That's right. The rest of the world misbehaves, but there's no accountability in terms of that. Okay, I think this even goes beyond that. Hmm. Because uh, I think the reference he's making here is, I'm going to go ahead and discipline you so you don't lose your walk with me. Because if you lose your walk with me, you're like everybody else in the world. Right. And the kind of judgment they face lasts forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it's even more than just the uh, disciplinary thing. Maybe that's exactly what you were saying, Tim. Um, what advice is given to the hungry at the end of this chapter? Yeah, eat at home. Eat at home. You know, possible objection. Why, why can't you be patient and why can't you wait on one another? Why can't you get along with other people? Possible objection. Well, I'm so hungry. And so his answer is, eat at home. <laughs> In other words, do whatever you can so that you can be the polite person that really gets along with other people. I, I also take that to mean if you need to take your medicine or you need to get extra sleep or you need to do whatever you need to do, do whatever you need to do so that you can be a good brother in Christ to other people in the congregation. Okay, uh, communion is a great example given in the greater context here. He, he spends these verses 23 through uh, 32 really focusing on uh, the Lord's Supper, but it's a part of a bigger argument here. What's the bigger context or the bigger issue? The church body gets given together. The, yeah, the body. Harmony in the body. Lack of dissension. Uh, uh, having the kind of unity God wants us to have. That's right. I also put like a shared experience. Shared, I'll go with that too. I sure will. Sean took the quiz tonight. I am just, I want everybody to notice that. You don't see my skull. If you guys would pass your test up here, that'd be great. All right, chapter 12. We at least made it to the end of the 11th chapter last week. So let's jump in chapter 12. He says, now concerning. Now concerning. So it's not a therefore. This is, this is kind of like, have you noticed how many times the Apostle Paul has done this through 1 Corinthians? It's kind of like, okay, here's one item. Let's deal with this. Here's another item. Let's deal with this. So he's just spent a lot of time talking about this. Which, by the way, when he deals with these items, you notice how sometimes he comes back to them. Because he started off in the first chapter talking about division in the church. Now that shouldn't be. And he comes back and he deals with it in a bigger way uh, a couple more times. Now, at the beginning of the 12th chapter, he's going to deal with some other misunderstandings they've got. And this, guys, I think this is really relevant because there's a lot of churches that have some interesting views about the Holy Spirit and the way the Holy Spirit works. Um, yeah, with the Holy Spirit. Mm, uh, we're going to talk a, a lot about the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit because this, this is the section in the Bible that deals with it more than any other place. Chapters 12 through 14 and especially the, uh, some of the things said here but especially when we get over to chapter 14. Okay, well in 13... Uh, chapter 12, now concerning the spiritual gifts. The word used for gift throughout here is not doron. It's not, a, it's not the word you guys are used to, which means kind of like a gift you give somebody. It's not the word. It's the word from which we get uh, uh, charismatic. or uh, It comes from charis, which, which is the word for what? Joy. Uh, grace. It's, and grace just means uh, uh, a gift that makes glad. But it's, it's tied with graciousness, and that's the word that's used throughout this, this context. Just a little nuance of difference that maybe we'll be able to point out. And I, I guess one of the reasons I wanted to say that is I'm afraid sometimes our minds are programmed when we hear the word gift. What, will you tell me, what do most people think of when you think of a spiritual gift? That's too open-ended of a question, isn't it? I, I would think it'd be something that some talent, some talent type of thing. That's, a, yeah. that, that, that's exactly what I'm thinking. I think most people automatically go to talent or ability. Mm -hmm. No doubt, some of the things that he's going to be talking about here are talents and abilities. So that does make sense. But I think sometimes we limit this too much because the term... Uh, the very word he uses, but the idea of a gift does not always have to be a talent or ability. Sometimes a gift is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So, if you happen to be 
one of God's people in a specific place, you could actually say that was a gift that God gave you because it put you in the right place at the right time. And so any Christian can do this. Now, the, the reason I want to say that is because some, some gifts the Bible talks about apply to everybody. Some gifts are much more specific, and he's going to be specific here, and he's going to say that there are some special things that have been given to some people that have not been given to other people. And it's very interesting to me because uh, every time you get a listing like this in the Bible, guess what? It's different. Okay, now what does that tell you? If every time there's a listing of the spiritual gifts and they're not identical, it's not like, well, here, here they are, here are the five spiritual gifts. Boom, 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 boom. God gave a lot of them. Okay, and um, they, one of the... They could come in any form or fashion. And why would they change? Why would there be differences? Situations change. People are different. Yes. Situation calls for different things. And we're going to specifically see in chapter 13, uh, I firmly believe, and I, I, I hope you guys, I hope it's easy to see, if we take enough time going through this, that this was a very, there were several miraculous special gifts that God gave for a specific purpose at a specific time when the church was young that really no longer applies today. In fact, I, I think that's one of the major teachings of, this is, this is the most in-depth place in the Bible where it talks about miraculous spiritual gifts. And the crescendo here, the middle of this, the core, he's talking about, don't expect this to last forever. Well, I, I think that's huge. Well, let's, let's start this, because he's, he's on this subject about the spiritual gifts. He says, now concerning the spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when, when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols. However, uh, I lost my place. Therefore, I tell you that three. First. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols. However, you, uh, you were led. It just doesn't make sense. I think I printed this out wrong. No, it's, 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 it's. Okay, uh, you, you've got the ESV too? You read along with that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll change now. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, he's talking, remember back in chapter 10, verse 20, where he talks about uh, when they sacrifice meat to idols, who are they really sacrificing it to? Demons. Demons. There's some demonic influence associated with with some idol worship. And he says, listen, in your past life, you've been led astray by things like this before you were Christians. He says, therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking, no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Okay. He's going to, he's, it seems to me what's happening here is, He's laying the groundwork, and he's going to introduce us to this idea of the working of the Holy Spirit. And he's starting in the most general way, and he's saying, listen, one of the things you need to understand is, if anything takes you away from, or is against what Jesus stands for, then you can rest assured that's not from God. But if this is something that's really from God, then the, the result of this ought to be something that's actually bringing you closer to Jesus. In fact, doesn't this just make you think about uh, in John, when Jesus said, when he was telling his disciples, when the Holy Spirit comes, when he comes, he will testify about me. His job is going to be to point people to Jesus. In a broad sort of way, that's exactly what he's saying here. Which, by the way, if, if, if you guys are taking notes, there's one I want you to write down. Deuteronomy chapter 13. And the reason I want you to write this down is... I can't remember the number of times I've referred to this, but I refer to it often. I don't think I've ever stopped and read it. Just always refer to it. I want you to have this in your notes. Deuteronomy chapter 13. And this is the first few verses. If you want to flip back there for just a second, I'm going to go ahead and read this to you. But this, is, this has been a principle that God has always used with His people. And it's a little more specific than this, but it starts off kind of like, think, use your head. 
look at this. Deuteronomy chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, it says, If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder which he has spoken about takes place, it's <laughs> exactly right. That's exactly where we are. <laughs> okay, stop right there for just a second. He says, if there's somebody who comes, a prophet, or, or somebody who comes along and he says he's representing God, and he's got a miracle, and he actually performs a miracle. Okay, now, before you read any further, what does that mean? Does that mean, wow, we need to follow this guy? Mm -hmm. No, you've got to test him. <laughs> okay, he's saying, what if this guy comes along, and by the way, there's a lot of shy people that come along that claim to do stuff, and they don't do stuff, but what if he really does do something? What if there really is a miracle? Which, by the way, it, 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 I'm going to read this in just a second, but a lot of people, that's all they need. Mm -hmm. They go to somebody and say, I, I don't care, I was really healed. Mm -hmm. It really happened. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what this passage is talking about? It's talking about stuff, it's not talking, there, there's plenty of information about the guys who are just totally fake. This is talking about somebody who can really do something. Okay, let's finish reading. He says, if he does... He, he says he's going to announce some wonder, and it actually takes place. But then he says, let's follow other gods. I.e., i.e., anything other than what God has already spoken. Sure. So if, if this guy's got a different message, I don't care if he can do miracles or not. He said, it, I mean, in fact, if he can do miracles, but he says, let's follow other gods, gods that you have not known, and let us worship them. You must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow and him you must revere. Keep his commandments and obey them and serve, serve him and hold fast to him. That prophet, and he goes on to talk about that prophet or dreamer must be put to death. But, but the thing that really gets me here is even if he's really able to do something, but the test... And it even sounds like God's behind it. Well, or God uses it. Uses it. God uses it. Okay. Over in chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 18, it makes the point that if somebody comes and speaks on behalf of God and they make some prophecy, if they're really from God, that prophecy will always come true. It will always come true. Because if they represent God, God's perfect. So if they say something... I'm just so sorry, but I've got to say this because of a conversation we had at D group the other night. If they say the world's going to end and the world didn't end, mm -hmm. then what's, what's, what should that tell us about somebody? False prophet. Tell us they're not really representing God. It is just so interesting to me. We got off talking about some of these guys that have changed, changed their tunes about three or four times. Why? Because the end hasn't come yet. But they're still reading the newspaper. And but I miscalculated. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, right. I apologize. Yeah. Okay, okay. Deuteronomy chapter 18 says, if they say it, then it has to be true 100% of the time, or you know they're not from God. But Deuteronomy 13 says, even if these guys come and do some miraculous signs, that's still not enough. It's not just proof. You know, it comes true, or here's a miraculous sign. It, in addition to proof, it has to be consistent with what God already said. Okay, 1 John, the fourth chapter, talks about the same thing. He says, he says, how can you, he says, don't accept every spirit. Don't accept everybody who says they're from God. You test the spirits. You test these people who come along to find out if they're really from God or not. And he's talking in broad general terms. And I know this sounds really general here, but the principle is this. It's not just somebody who says, oh yeah, Jesus is Lord. And then he starts to say something contrary to what Jesus says in the Bible. That's not really saying Jesus is Lord. Uh, to say Jesus is Lord, you have to speak consistently with everything Jesus says. Hmm. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a broad statement, but it means a lot. It, it has to be consistent with God's truth, or we know that this is not from God. Okay, so in, in a statement here, let's come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If, if it leads us away from Jesus, we know it's not from Him. If it's really from the Holy Spirit, it's actually going to uplift Jesus and it's going to be totally consistent with what Jesus has said, right? Okay, before we leave this verse, I know this is just a little off track, but I, 
I want to share something with you. I, I ran into a guy, it's been several years ago now, who used this argument, and I want you to respond to this argument. He said he knows that Saul, before he became known as Paul, he knows he was saved on the road to Damascus. And the reason he knows Saul was saved on the road to Damascus is this verse right here. He said, because when he, remember the experience Saul had on the road to Damascus, he's hit by the bright light, he's blinded, Lord, Lord. falls his knees, and what does he say? He says, who are you, Lord? And he says, well, nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So I know that guy had the Holy Spirit because he said, call Jesus Lord. Okay, now how would you respond if somebody told you that that proves that Saul was saved? Because nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. What was the question uh, again? Lord, who are you? Uh, yes, who was the Lord? <laughs> so okay, the so question was, if he was yeah, the question of who he was. They called everybody Lord. They, they always called somebody superior Lord. Oh, yeah, that's... It's very true too. Mark, it's somebody it's somebody it's line, I call him Lord. <laughs> Lord, Lord of the, the Castle. Lord Lord of... Saved by the Holy Spirit. That's what he said. That's that's the way he interpreted this passage. That's what he was saying. That's how he said, "I know that Saul was saved." Right there. Because but he, but he didn't that. call him Jesus. Excuse me. He didn't call him Jesus. He didn't say. Him. He called Jesus Lord though. Well, but okay. but he didn't say Jesus is Lord. Right. No, you know what I'm thinking is he knew he was being. Confronted by some higher power of some kind, but he Obviously. didn't know which higher power it was. It might have been Jesus, or it might have been God, or it might have been one of these other ones that we're talking about. This, yeah, and, and by the way, I did the conversation because you know, Jesus, which one of you, which one of these are you? And Jesus did answer him, hmm. right? And so he knew before the end of the conversation. Does that mean he was saved before the end of the conversation? No, no. Okay, I'm glad you're shaking your head. No, but how do you know that? Later it says he was told to get up and be baptized and be saved. For, for the forgiveness of your sins. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Why would Ananias say, arise and be, this is chapter 22, verse 16. Why would he say, arise and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins? If his sins were already forgiven. Okay. The, the, other, the other one I want you to think about here too is Matthew chapter 7. What are people going to say on the last day? Many are going to say to me, Lord, Lord, Lord. Lord. Didn't we drive out demons in your name? Didn't we <laughs> preach in your name? Didn't we perform miraculous signs in your name? And the Lord's going to say to them, Depart from me. I never knew you. Obviously, that's not what this passage is talking about. It's talking, it's, it's talking general terms to say if it goes against any... It's not just letting these words roll off the end of your lips. It's saying if, if, if somebody is inconsistent with the things that Jesus is teaching, you know it's not from God. If it is from God, it will be consistent with what Jesus teaches in the fact that He is Lord. Okay, now the more specifics. I, I hope you don't mind that. I think that's kind of fun real life experiences and how would you respond to that. Okay, now... Now there are a variety of gifts, this is verse 4, but the same Spirit, by the way, why is he emphasizing that? Variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. What's been one of the major themes he's just coming back to over and over again throughout the chapter, throughout the entire book? One Spirit, one body. One. We're all together. Unity. So he's even going to emphasize that even when he's dealing with the, the gifts of the Spirit, right? Okay. There are a variety of spirits, a variety of gifts, but one Spirit. And there are a variety of services or service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Okay, so he's tying the gifts here with service and activity or work. And this whole idea of service, service is what? Helping, helping others, helping the body, right? So all tied together there. Uh, Verse 7, to each one is given a manifestation of the Spirit for, for the common good. Well, I thought we left this topic of unity. He can't get, he, he can't get that out of his mind, can he? It's just such a, it, it permeates the entire book. Because we've got to do this together. And if it's really from God, it's going to help build the body. 
because it's one spirit, right? Okay, it's for the common good. Now he starts listing, it's spe listing them specifically. Verse 8, to one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. Both these words, by the way, uh, are different ways of focusing on God's truth. Hmm. We're going to get to chapter 13 next week. We get to chapter 13. The basic point it's going to make is the Holy Spirit specifically gave special gifts to the early church until they had the Scripture. They had to have extra help. Can you imagine what it would be like to try to be an effective church or try to be a Christian if you didn't have a copy of the Bible? <laughs> How in the world are you going to do that? Especially if people come along and say, hey, i got a word from God. Right now, when somebody says, hey, I've got a word from God, I don't know if that bothers you. That doesn't bother me. Because I can, I can very easily go to the Bible and check them out. Right? Which, by the way, I'll be honest with you, I, I checked them out even before they said anything. As soon as they said, I got a word from them. <laughs> I'll tell you why later. But, <laughs> but it, it, before you have a Bible, if somebody says that, what are you going to do? Well, in the early, what did God do to protect His early church, to protect them from people who come along and do something? Like that. Whatever they prophesied. And then, okay, what were, the, okay, what were the interpreters for? The interpreters were for... To interpret when they were talking, speaking in tongues. Yes, if somebody spoke in tongues, you had to have an interpreter. That's one of the things he's going to say. Okay, and why do you need somebody speaking in tongues? Because different languages were there, and not everybody understood. Okay, okay, that's that's exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2. Speaking in different languages, which by the way is the only place where it clearly illustrates what it means by speaking in tongues. People heard in different languages. And what are the other gifts here? But there was no interpreter at that instance, right there. Uh, Peter stood up and explained. Yeah, I thought everyone understood in their own oh, language. Oh, yes, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. People understood in their own language. Chapter 2. Thank you. Thank you. But, but then Peter does stand up and explain the whole thing of what's going on. Right. Okay, what are the other gifts? We're going to spend a lot of time on the tongues issue because he's going to... Spend a lot of time on the tongues issue in chapter 14. Gift of knowledge. Okay. Why do you need the gift of knowledge? That's the one that tells you he's saying yes, what he's got from God is true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If somebody stands up and they... By the way, if somebody stands up and speaks on behalf of God, what's the term used in the Bible for somebody who speaks on behalf of God? Prophet. A prophet. Okay, the gift of prophecy, that's... That one's pretty clear because you're speaking on behalf of God. There are going to be several terms used, such as knowledge, wisdom, and discernment. And sometimes it's hard to figure out what's the difference between knowledge, wisdom, and discernment. But it always helps me to try to put myself in the shoes of, or, or in the setting of the first century church. When somebody comes along and says, i got a word from God, you would need people who know whether or not, and we're not talking about interpreting a tongue, we're talking about somebody who speaks clearly, in the language everybody can say, but they said this is from God. You need somebody to, there, because you don't have a Bible to check them out. Right. Somebody, that's with, knows about somebody the that has discernment, wisdom, knowledge of the truth of God that can sit there and say, that, that's not from God. Or that is from God. So you, And to be able to explain why they are saying that. Yes. But these first gifts that... There is a difference between knowledge and wisdom, by the way. What's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Knowledge is, knowledge is something you learn. Knowledge is the information. Wisdom is how you use it. Application. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Mark, uh, this is uh, actually an important concept to wrap my, myself around. You know, you run across a lot of fruitcakes every day. In fact, I get a couple right up north in my men's group. And, and one guy saying, God talked to me. You know, God talked every five seconds, and I said, well, what do you mean? Is it because you were quiet and, and you got an inference, or, or did God actually, or no, God spoke to me? So, is the point, is the point being, the Word of God is the Word, and when God says don't change one thing, any of it, is that, is that what we're referring to? So anything else that's non-Word, that's not in the Bible, 
would be impossible. In other words, somebody says, well, God told me to go out and, and chop wood. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. right. what's the answer to that? Uh, let me just be real honest with you. This, this, really, this subject scares me. Really scares me. Excuse me too. Number one, on. number one, I really don't think people, I think people have been programmed, and I think they've been uh, uh, taught to speak that way, and I don't, I really don't think people mean to say what they say sometimes. And if somebody is claiming that, oh no, God specifically gave me a message, that really scares me. Because Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says, if we, and who's saying this? This is an apostle saying, if we, or, 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 or an angel from heaven comes to you and preaches to you another gospel, contrary to the one that's already preached, let him be accursed. And he says it again. Well, here's my problem. If, if God's going to tell you something that's already there, why is he telling you something that's already there? But if he's going to tell you something that's not already there, then what does the Bible say about that? If it's not already there, then I'm not supposed to listen to that. That's what really scares me, because if they really, if they really think they are receiving something from God, then that's contrary to what the Word of God says. And it's even more frightening, Mark, when most of it's trite. Like God told me to, you know, ride up this hill yesterday morning. Okay, and let me just go further on this since we're on the subject. I don't know how many times this has happened where somebody who's... Uh, I, I want to be careful here because I really don't think people actually mean this. But the words they use, it's, no, no, God told me this. God told me this. Well, then God made a whole bunch of mistakes. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because sometimes people will say, no, God told me I was supposed to buy this. And I was supposed to do that. And, I was supposed to... and if you added all that stuff up and you went back, you're not going to find that it was 100% accurate every time. No, but if it's from God, it has to be 100% accurate. You understand what I'm saying? So, what I think people, honestly, what I think people think most of the time when they use this kind of term, what I think is really going on is they feel like, they really feel like this is something God wants them to do. Well, you know what? Yeah, that scares me too. But I'd much rather them say, I just really feel this. You know what? I can go with that. I, I, think, I think you need to work on that. And I think, listening to the Bible, uh, 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 Jeremiah says, God told Jeremiah, the heart's more deceitful than any other thing. So you need to be careful listening to your emotions. But I think that's what people really mean most of the time, is that I just really feel like this is from God. Yeah. This morning at 4.30, I was doing my little Bible study, and my coffee. And something came upon me after Sunday and doing some things, and you know, I, I thought about it. I knew it would bring good to someone. I don't know if it will come about. I'm not talking about it. I talked to Willie about it. And I think that, you know, if something like that's an idea, something that gives me, it would give me pleasure to see it come about. And, but no way do I think that that was something that the Divine Lord, revelation. Revelation. Good. I think that I was moved so towards glad the direction and the yeah. thought <laughs> yeah. that would do someone some good and, they, and for the whole, you know, and I'm going to play out on it. But I at least, and I'm just confided in Willie in it, but, you know, it's something that, that I feel I should try. Yes. But I'm not going to go. I think it's. Yeah, you, you, you know what? Other people, yes. And I mean, guys, think this through because when people say that, but let's think of this in the big term. When people say that to the non-Christian world, God told us to do that. And what happens if it flops? What's the non-Christian world going to think? That wasn't God's fault. It's because we put words in His mouth. Right. And I know I'm getting a little off subject here, but uh, yeah. you, you did. It. I remember when you did a sermon a couple of years ago, which, which really resonated with me, Mark. And I remember you saying, you know, I get an awfully nervous when people say talk to God because your point is so well taken. How many people did he actually talk to? Who were they? They were very significant. Yes. It was Moses, Abraham. And I, I personally know what I think. I think some people do it because they're puffed up and they don't want to get right. Yeah, and again, they lose themselves into the one and the Right. And I, and I don't want to don't want to read motive into stuff. I just I just am very very cautious. Oh yeah. People say things like that, and I think biblically we have to be. But for this, try to put yourself in a world where the Bible hasn't come yet. 
And God wants to protect His church. How's He going to do that? He gives them special gifts, and they would need special gifts for something like this. Okay, what were you going to say, Brian? Well, you know, I have a hard time when I tell a story when everybody says, how did you around me? Yeah. Because it was through praying and the thought of her name. But, like, I don't say, oh, 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 you're going right. But how do you go about telling that story? Because you don't want to say the wrong stuff. You know? By the way, I, I do not want to say God does answer prayers. God does work in our lives. Right. But as far as God revealing truth, like I never say there's an audible voice that ever came down. It's just praying. And... You know, Mark, the day I came into this church, I often use the expression, God was talking to me, but, I, but what I mean is, is God's even necessary, He works through people. Through He's working people. in your life. Yeah. He's that? working in your life. In exactly. Your so I happen to turn into the TV and all of a sudden I see this Messianic rabbi, but it was the whole notion that Jesus, and when Gail came home, I said, Jesus, someone's talking. I got to go to church with you next week. That's what it 